are back on the Zero Hour. I am your host, Richard R.J. Escal. A lot of tr people are having trouble these days decoding uh, the news uh, that's coming out economically. Uh, and most of the people having difficulty understanding the news economically, I would argue, are members of the news media who report on the economy because I'm getting a lot of mixed signals from my colleagues when it comes to the state of the economy. I'm also uh, getting mixed signals from the Democratic Party and economic establishments. So here to help us hopefully decode all of that is uh, our good friend and a uh, good friend of the program and uh, insightful economist and author, uh, Richard Wolf. You know him well. He's a regular on the program. He is professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is also currently a visiting professor at the graduate program in international affairs at uh, the New School University in New York. And he has a program called Economic Update, which you can see, let's see, every Tuesday evening on Free Speech TV. So without any further ado, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Richard. As usual, I'm very glad to be here uh, in conversation with you. And I'm very glad to have you, particularly because uh, I'm seeing headlines uh, like this. Uh, U.S. unemployment claims edge lower. Now, uh, edging lower uh, in this case means 1.5 million applications in a week uh, of fewest weekly applications, I should say, um, which to me is not really, I guess you could say it, it's edging lower uh, when three nuclear bombs go off in your neighborhood last week and only two went off this week. But it seems to me that we are still in the midst of an ongoing and unfolding catastrophe. And I'm hearing at best mixed, mixed signals in the media about you know, things are getting better. So am I being overly gloomy or are my colleagues being overly Pollyanna-ish or is something else happening altogether? No, I think you, you captured it in your first uh, example of the nuclear uh, weapons that went off in your neighborhood. Um, yes, these numbers bounce around from week to week, from month to month, uh, but you're supposed to, at least you're taught this in graduate school, you're supposed to look for the trends to understand what's going on and not to look for the noisy bumping around the trends, which often reflect uh, temporary phenomena or adjustments in the collecting of data or the processing of, of it into these final statistics. Uh, and so you're not supposed to do exactly what the media seems to think it ought to do, which is to breathlessly report each little glitch this way or that. Uh, here's the bottom line that no one should misunderstand. As of the end of the last full month, May, the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that 29 million Americans were claiming unemployment compensation. Now, this has to be now analyzed. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it is an underestimate of the number of people that are out of work because for a variety of reasons, people out of work may not file claims for unemployment compensation or if they do file them, they are being processed and have not yet begun to pay out and so they're not in this number. But let's stay with the number of 29, uh, uh, roughly 29 million Americans that the Bureau of Labor Statistics released. Okay, that is one-fifth, 20% of the American labor force. And that means one out of five members of the labor force, that's people who either have a job or are looking for a job, one out of five of those people has no job. If you're in a family that has more than five people in it, counting mother, father, children, 
grandparents, cousins, and uncles, and most of us have more than five of all of those, then you are being affected by this. Uh, in other words, this level of unemployment touches virtually every family. Of course, some more, some less, and there might be a few that escape it altogether. But this is a, here we go now, catastrophic level of non-performance, non-functioning of the American economy. And whether it goes up by a million or more a week uh, really makes no difference at all. Uh, it is possible that we are slowly, quote unquote, reopening. But for those, for those of you who follow the statistics, places like Texas, Arizona, and Florida that were leaders in the reopening are now, unfortunately, leaders in the resurgence of new coronavirus cases. So we have no idea where this is going at this point. All we know is that the reality already is an economy in the worst shape that the U.S. economy has been in since the 1930s, which means just shy, we are right now just shy of the worst economic conditions in the last century. So, uh, and by the way, just to be clear, uh, for anyone who's wondering, when, when we talk about 20% of the workforce not working and, you know, some of them for various reasons, maybe they're not looking or, 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 or so on, uh, might not be uh, counted in these active employment numbers. We're not talking about 90-year-olds and we're not talking about elementary school children. We're talking about people of working age who exactly. in one way... Be right in one way or another, and not participating in this workforce activity. Right. So that is an enormous number. Um, now, what if, from my understanding, for example, in 2008, 2009, when we had the last financial crisis, uh, probably paling in, in comparison now to this one, it took an extraordinarily long time. It took years and years to recover from that. And, you know, I've heard people say that's because the government didn't invest enough in stimulus spending and real stimulus spending as opposed to tax cuts and so on. Uh, that was prolonged quite a while. Now, this event, you just alluded to it, unlike even that terrible economic event, is not necessarily going to be a one-time shock. We're talking about a protracted um, experience of, of um, pandemic and shutdowns from the pandemic, possibly also forming waves as some of these states uh, may open too soon and then have to reclose and so on. So it seems to me that not only is it bigger than 2008, which was a, you know, a, a short, sharp shock, if you will, uh, that it took a very long time to recover from, we could be talking about an extended shock or multiple shocks. Uh, and I, that would seem to me it would take much longer to recover from even than the first time around, last time around. So I wanted to ask you, Richard, well, first of all, is my interpretation in your view correct? And secondly, what do you think about my concerns about the time it would take to recover? Well, I think your concerns are absolutely on target. I would tell I would tell you this, that predicting how long the recovery will take is an impossible task. I, don't beat yourself up that you can't be clear whether it will be the way the, the news pe me media folks like to say it. Will it be a quick recovery that is a V shape? You go down on, like on one, the left side of a V and then you shoot back up on the right side of a V or will it be a U shape? So you go down and you stay down a while and then you come up or will it be an L where you go down and then you're stuck horizontally at the bottom of the vertical part of the L? Uh, nobody knows. I don't know. And anyone who tells you confidently uh, that it will be of this kind or another is a person I would advise you to stop talking to, go find someone else to speak with because they're predicting the future and nobody can do that. Having said that, 
Let me tell you why, in my estimation, this is not going to be easy. Uh, that's not a prediction. It just, it, when you look at the list of obstacles, um, it becomes very difficult to imagine a speedy exit from this disaster. So let me, I'm going to give you only two, two or three of the basic considerations. When you have massive unemployment of the sort that we do, one of the things it does is give an immediate invitation to every employer to take advantage of the unemployment. What does that mean? The employer goes to those workers still employed by him or by her. And he says to them, look, John, look, Mary, uh, I hate to do this, but it's really hard times. Uh, our business has suffered from the pandemic or from the crash or whatever. And so I'm very sorry, but I'm going to have to cut your salary by 20 percent. I'm going to have to contribute less to your pension. I'm going to have to ask you to come in a half an hour earlier without an extra pay. Blah, blah, blah. Why does the employer do it? Partly because of what he just said. And there's some truth to it. Partly because it's an opportunity he cannot afford to let go. It's an opportunity to economize on his labor costs. And even if the employer is a very decent man or woman who won't want to do it, his or her competitors are going to be doing it. So pretty soon to survive, he or she will have to do it too. I'm telling you this because the downward trend in workers' wages which is already underway, is going to continue and is going to prolong the economic difficulty, not improve it. Second, the rescue, the stimulus, the relief packages already passed in the last three months have interestingly left out uh, support for cities, towns, villages, and states to maintain the employment at those levels and to maintain the social services that people get from their public authorities. Meanwhile, the unemployment and the collapsed economy mean that cities, states, and so on are getting much less revenue than they normally would. So unless they're helped by the federal government, the reduced revenue will have to mean they either cut back services or lay off their employees, or more likely, both of those. And that, too, will deepen and prolong um, the downturn, the bad economic news, uh, and so on. Last point. The United States is more interdependent with the rest of the world than it has ever been in its history since it became an independent country. And the result of that reality is that whatever we want to say about the United States, we have to take into account the international relationships and their impact on the U.S. economy. So, for example, the decision by the Trump administration to wage a trade war, an economic war on the number two economy in the world, China, like the decision to break effectively the alliance with Western Europe so that those countries go their own way is making the rest of the world economic systems turn away from the United States, just as Mr. Trump has turned the U.S. economy away from them. And that will not improve or speed our recovery. It will slow it down. So you put these kinds of considerations together and others like them and the notion that we're going to come out of this uh, downturn uh, quickly is very, very hard to sustain. And then there's an, uh, another dimension to this, Richard Wolf, which it seems to me that, uh, and I want to explore this with you uh, a little bit, um, it seems to me that when, even when you have a... Uh, an economic catastrophe of this kind, even in the quote unquote best case scenarios, there's a certain loss of wealth as well as long term earning power for the people that were hit hardest by it. I'm thinking, for example, of some of the studies I saw 
years ago saying that for young people, for example, uh, coming out of school, entering the workforce, that the amount of money they earn in the first year or two of employment will affect their lifetime of earnings. Now, that means to me that for young people coming into this economy, they could, in effect, be paying for it the rest of their working lives. And it seems to me that there are other ways in which uh, we might, we as a country might walk away whenever this thing is declared over, if it ever is, saying, okay, everything's fine now, as we more or less did after 2009, and forget about the long-term harm that's been done to a lot of working people while we rescued a lot of wealthy people in the way we handled the bailout. Yeah, I mean, there are loads of those studies. There are studies about uh, the 1930s that talked about the number of people then attending colleges, which is a much smaller number relative to population than are doing it now. But a significant number of those uh, had to drop out of college because they had no money to pay for it their parents having lost jobs, et cetera, in the Great Depression, they couldn't help anymore. So people's into educations got interrupted. Many of those people never went back to finish. Uh, we have to assume that their productivity, because they could not finish their education, their productivity and whatever jobs they got was lower than it would otherwise have been. Exactly that is happening now. We don't even know between the fact that colleges can't get people together in classrooms, uh, there was very little real teaching going on uh, after the 15th of March in this past semester. Um, I have been told by my university, as many of my colleagues have, that it is now unclear whether we will have classes in the fall or whether we will continue to do this thing called distance learning, which is a... Uh, how shall I be? I'm trying to be polite here, is a disguise for very little learning, in fact, at all. Mm -hmm. um, and what that will do in the long run, all we know is it's not helpful. It's not positive. Um, there will be colleges that close who will have to turn their students away because the number of people going to college is now shrinking. You cannot afford to borrow in a time like this. You cannot afford to rack up the debt that is now normal for college students, especially when the jobs they face, as you, Richard, rightly point out, are not good in terms of the amount of money they pay, are not secure in terms of how long you'll have them. All of these conditions are militating against the rosy scenario. It's not to say that I know it won't happen. It could, if everything lines up in a good way. But what we're really seeing is a kind of chickens coming home to roost a long period of time when the can was kicked down the road, when decisions were made to get through a, a bad dot-com crisis in 2000 or a bad subprime mortgage crisis in 2008 by heaving money at the economy. All of the instabilities, all of the imbalances created by those quick solution approaches are now coming home uh, to plague us. And there's a little footnote here that I would like to insert, if you don't mind. Sure. There is a, there's an agency that keeps records for the United States. Uh, it's called the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER. They are the official agency that, that decides when the U.S. economy is in a recession, when it comes out of a recession. That's their job. And they issued a statement a few days ago in which they said something that also didn't get the attention it should have gotten. It dated the beginning of the economic downturn we are now living through in February of this hmm. year. Why is that important? Because the coronavirus had not hit this country in February. It's a wonderful reminder that capitalism as a system has a built-in instability. On average, every four to seven years, it has a downturn. If it's serious and severe and deep, we call it a crash or a recession or a depression. Uh, some of them aren't deep 
and some of them don't last a long time. But we've had three so far, 2000, 2008, and now 2020. And I know it's fashionable to blame the crisis on something external to the capitalist economic system, uh, like the pandemic, like the virus. But it's a bit of a ruse. It's a bit of a um, an attempt to deflect criticism from capitalism for being unstable by blaming it on a, if you like, outside agitator, in this case, the coronavirus. What the NBER did was to do the hard work, date the time of the, the crash beginning, and you can see that what the pandemic did at best is to make a bad crash worse, but it isn't the cause it should not have its name on this crash. This is capitalism's business cycle, a boom bust cycle, whatever you want to call it. It's got a lot of names. It is something built into capitalism that all of the efforts of the last 300 years to free capitalism from this instability, none of them have ever worked. And we're in yet another one. And this one, unfortunately, is a real doozy. Again, we're talking with economist Richard Wolf on the Zero Hour. <clears throat> and uh, I want to uh, talk, since we've talked about the extent of the crisis now, I want to talk about um, the political climate when it comes to a potential solution we have. We, you and I have already talked about the Democratic Congress's proposal and the weaknesses of that, the HEROES Act, as they call it, uh, and I found a recent article to me to be a sort of harbinger of where the debate might be going. It was uh, uh, published as a four-author op-ed in the Washington Post. Uh, and the authors were, um, let's see, Jason Furman, who is, I think, uh, considered by many to be close to the Joe Biden team and, uh, of course, was a... Uh, part of the last Democratic administration, Timothy Geithner, uh, who was, of course, Treasury Secretary under Barack Obama, and then two Republicans, including Glenn Hubbard, who served under, I believe it was George W. Bush, so and Melissa Kearney. So we have this group, which, uh, you know, this whole notion of bipartisan economic policy is it's almost touching to me and it's naivete, but that's just me. But anyway, I, if I may, I just like, I just like you to read a, um, the, what I think is a key paragraph from it. Uh, it says, and I quote, a successful recovery plan must help businesses revive and resume hiring. Now note that it places businesses before jobs already in the first sentence, it must bolster incomes, battered by the pandemic shutdown without creating disincentives to work as if the biggest problem facing our economy right now is people are too lazy to work. And it must support state and local governments in their efforts, uh, helping to heal the economy and shield their residents from the worst effects of the downturn. Fine. So with this in mind, the four of us uh, from both political parties are releasing a plan to achieve those goals. Now, uh, that before going into the nature of the plan itself, that strikes me as a kind of ideological statement. But I want your thoughts on that, because I, it feels to me that the members, uh, the leaders from both parties here of economic thinking are both saying, first and foremost, that the only way to rebuild an economy is using businesses as a channel, and that therefore a recovery plan, which is by definition a government creation, must help businesses and therefore at some point down the line incomes uh will be helped uh and jobs will be created is that uh, am i being overly harsh no you are describing two very old things there is absolutely i've read that uh that article uh myself i, I know those individuals i'm familiar with their work uh, their past and now this article are all of a piece. They are the consensus. That's why two Democrats and two Republicans who have been advisors to presidents uh, can get together and very calmly and politely work out something they both 
agree to. Uh, this is the normal to which uh, Republicans and Democrats are both uh, swearing loyalty. The president, Mr. Trump, the contender, Mr. Biden, are both telling everybody how they want to get the economy back to normal, as if the following sentence weren't the, t the truth. It's the normal that got us here. The normal is what produced a kind of capitalism that crashes every four to seven months and has now crashed this way, a kind of society that produces inequality so extreme as to uh, bring a Trump into office, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why anyone in their right mind would want a quote unquote return to normality really is is extraordinary. And the ideological aspect of that screams at you. They really want it to be like it was. They therefore do not understand or want to see that the way uh, the Clintons and the Bushes and all the people who went before, the way they built up a system in the shambles we find it today, having failed to prepare for a pandemic, having been, we've been assaulted by viruses umpteen times in the history of the human race and in modern American history. There's no excuse for not having the test kits or the ventilators, none. This system failed to prepare. Once hit by the, uh, the pandemic, it failed to, management, uh, to manage it. As I'm speaking to you, less than 5% of Americans have even been tested uh, for this thing. We don't even know where it is. I mean, this is a colossal failure. And then we have the crash of capitalism, which again was neither prepared for nor managed very well. I mean, the normal, you really want us to get back to the normal? The ideology is spectacular. Last point. You're particularly on target, Richard, by focusing people's attention on all of this involving a huge amount of money given directly to businesses and almost in all cases with no strings attached. And let me drive that point home. In Germany, the business community went to the government for bailouts, as capitalists everywhere have been doing. The German government gave them a big chunk of money but it was on condition. One condition, which should come as a surprise to nobody, but of course in America it will, one condition was, we'll give you a lot of money, you cannot fire or lay off anyone. Here's therefore the result. Over the last 10 weeks, unemployment has quadrupled in the United States, from roughly 4.5% to roughly 20%, okay? In Germany, 10 weeks ago, unemployment was 5%. And in Germany today, as I'm speaking, unemployment is 6%. There is no surge in unemployment in, the, in Germany. It's a capitalist country, but you can't get away in the capitalist country of Germany, and by the way, it's true in France, it's true even in England, you can't do to the working class in those countries what you can do in the United States. Their unions are stronger, they have socialist and communist political parties that have big constituents, and the, the cultural influence in those countries of the, of the power of the government and of its responsibility to the mass of the working class is such that even conservative leaders uh, like Boris Johnson in England or Macron in France or Angela Merkel in Germany, they don't dare do there to their workers what we do in this country. And they don't because they would be out of office in a matter of days if they dared. That reality has to somehow sink in, but it doesn't to the likes of those four authors. They are happy to give business the money, tons of it, no conditions. They don't even mention in that article any conditions. And guess what? If you give the bulk of the trillions that are being given out to business, 
businesses will do what they always do. The chief executives, the major shareholders will use the relief money in whatever way they think advantages their company. They're not going to use it to hire more workers because they can't even sell what they're producing now with 20% of the people without work. They're not going to do socially useful things. They're going to play in the stock market. They're going to give each other bonuses. They're going to sock the money away. They're going to do what's good for the business. And we're all going to be wondering and scratching our heads, gee, why didn't the bailouts work better? Well, they didn't because you gave it to the wrong people. If you want to make sure that the economy gets a boost, Give it to the people you know will do with it what you need for society. And that means go out and spend it for goods and services that will give other people, the unemployed, the jobs to produce those goods and services. And to do that, you give money to the poorest people because they have no choice. They will spend it tomorrow. You give it to workers. You give it to the poor because they turn that money around and spend it. When you give that money to rich corporations, they do lots of other things that are more in their individual profit-driven interest. This does not take rocket science. Those four folks are doing an ideological job not to deal with virtually anything I've just said. Well, and um, last thought on this, I mean, there's a lot that could be said about this this plan and this op-ed, but this is one that, uh, you know, a couple sentences that I just, I short circuit when I read them and I just tested myself and I short circuit it again, which <laughs> is um, with the highest unemployment rates since the Great Depression to maintaining unemployment insurance support is essential to protect families and support demand. Fine. This makes economic sense. Evidence shows that every dollar paid in unemployment insurance adds a dollar fifty to the economy. Right there, I would say to myself, you think a logical person would say, what else can I find that will have that greater return in terms of restoring the economy of 50% greater than what we put into it comes out in growth? That's great. Let me find other ways to do that. But their next set, and let me certainly keep doing this. But they then go on to say instead, but extending the $600 weekly unemployment insurance benefit enacted at the start of the shutdown does not make sense now. Wait a minute, you just said I get a dollar fifty back for every dollar when better protections against COVID nineteen are being put in place. What I, I I haven't seen those, and the unemployment rate is coming down, meaning this year's nuclear bomb crater is slightly perhaps slightly right. smaller this week's than last week's. This we thus propose phasing down this federal benefit by tying it to the specific economic circumstances of individual states as if the economy of the state of that, that you live in affects the extent of the personal tragedy that your unemployment means to you and your family. So I just read this paragraph and go haywire. And um, uh, am I missing something? Or is this just more of an example? No, no you're in, not missing anything, but I can give you the context uh, the Democratic Party has decided it, that the next step in Congress, and this uh, Nancy Pelosi and the others, Schumer, uh, that they're going to pass another stimulus bill, uh, throwing another trillion dollars or so at the economy. My, my guess is they're doing that because they don't want Mr. Trump to be in the position of having thrown a lot of money at the economy and therefore claiming that he is helping the economy and, and claiming that the Democrats either couldn't or wouldn't or didn't. And so now they're going to do this thing. They're going to spearhead it. And the Republicans don't want that. Uh, there's a whole host of reasons for that. But they can't say don't throw a lot of money, partly because they just did that and partly uh, because it doesn't look good to an economy that's suffering uh, for the, Demo the Republican Party to be against helping folks who need it. So they have to be able to be opposed to another trillion, but make it sound like there is some plausible argument for it other than their desire not to put the government into even further debt, which is the only way 
that this uh, trillion they're proposing can be funded. And by the way, just so everybody's clear, why don't they want there to be more borrowing? The Republicans are always afraid, and that's their job as the representatives of business and the rich, that the more in debt the United States becomes, and it is currently becoming more in debt at a stupefying rate, all of this stimulus money is being uh, gotten by borrowing. The American government borrows. The great fear is that at some point, some politician, you know, a Bernie Sanders type, will get in and say, okay, uh, it's impossible for us to pay off these debts. You know, the way a lot of college students are now saying it's impossible for them to pay off student debt. Uh, and so we're not going to pay it. Well, the people who own that debt are the corporations and the rich. They don't want to see that, and therefore they want to keep the indebtedness of the government down. They got the lion's share of the first trillion given out as stimulus, and they don't want another one because then the benefit will go to the average person. That's what the Democrats want for the logic you just gave us. But it'll mean more debts, and that will hype up the pressure that may end up coming out of their hides. That's the reality. The rest is, as you put it, Richard, ideological noise designed to enable them to vote against something without looking like they're voting against that. Gotcha. So that, that gets back to my, among other things, my old definition of bipartisan, the word bipartisan, meaning the policies you get when you buy members of both parties. But um, right. unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, but Richard Wolf, economist, host of Economic Update, Tuesday evenings on Free Speech TV. Uh, fascinating to walk through this uh, catastrophe with you. Uh, let's hope sanity prevails more and more in our society. In the meantime, as always, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you also, Richard. And I, I, have, I am hopeful because I think the movement of criticism into the streets is an enormous step forward uh, and will help clarify thinking all around. Uh, well, perhaps next time we'll talk about that. But Richard, Wolf, right. thank, thanks again. And we will be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and you're listening to the Zero Hour.